an historical sense, Abe Saffron would have to be classified as Australia's most vile, amoral and absolutely corrupt criminals. He was a small Jewish boy from the wrong side of the tracks in Sydney's inner west. He grew up to be one of the most mysterious and slightly notorious of all Sydney colourful characters. He was utterly charming, highly intelligent, an extraordinarily accomplished businessman. And if rooting was an Australian Olympic sport, Abe would probably be a gold medalist. I think he was named by three Royal Commissions as being the number one organised criminal in Australia. He was the greatest manipulator of all. When it came to corruption in this state, no Mr Biggs could equal Ape Saffron with his influence right to the top of the tree. I'm not involved in any criminal activity whatsoever in Australia or anywhere else for that matter. I find the suggestion most offensive. Mysterious Abe Saffron was born in 1919. The youngest son of Polish immigrants, he grew up above a draper's shop in Annandale, in Sydney's in the West. 19, he was fined five pounds for illegal gambling. He enlisted in 1940, gained the rank of corporal, and was given a suspended sentence for receiving stolen goods. With backing from friends of his father, he started buying hotels, and at the age of 25, he took over the most glamorous nightclub in Australia. Walking into the resort was like walking into a slice of Hollywood. Full production numbers on stage, elegant dining, chicken in a basket was a big hit. The Roosevelt was where all of Sydney's social scene went to enjoy themselves, went to have a good time, and of course you could buy alcohol late into the evening even though it wasn't strictly legal. The fact that Abe had a past only enhanced his glamour. Beautiful young Doreen Krantz caught Abe's eye. They married in 1949, but Abe insisted on one fundamental rule. He did love her, um, but he told her that he couldn't stand the thought of spending his, the rest of his life with one person. This meant girlfriends, and Abe had plenty. But when baby Alan came along in 1950, Doreen hoped he'd change his ways. He only gave us three nights a week, that was it. He was a father those three nights, but the other nights he went off to his, he called it business. Of course, as I got old, I found out was business was his various mistresses. She um, always hoped that he'd change, but he never ever changed the arrangement that he made with her back then. Abe's swinging ways came naturally and he found he was in tune with the times when he visited America. In 1953, he teamed up with an American entrepreneur, Lee Gordon, and together they brought Frank Sinatra to Australia for the first time. I don't know, I'm just real excited and I'm sure it's going to be just wonderful. Oh, fine. Abe Saffron was a, a man that loved to be seen as the American showman. You know, he was always photographs with beautiful showgirls, and he copied everything American. And, uh, of course, at that stage in America, the Mafia was doing exactly what I said, organising its criminal activities. Back in Australia, Abe expanded interstate when he bought Raffles Hotel in Perth. And he now owns six pubs in Sydney. The only problem with that expansion is that in those days, liquor was highly controlled and you could only really own one hotel. Abe got around the one pub rule by getting his brothers and sisters to front for him in the six pubs he owned. Abe then supplied booze for his unlicensed Roosevelt 
uh, nightclub from his six hotels. He bought the grog from his own hotels at a great markup price and then on sold it to the patrons illegally uh, at the Roosevelt Club. Abe's prosperity and playboy image were attracting attention. Church groups were demanding greater government control and Abe, the king of sly grog, got his first bad press. The first public event that changed the perception of Abe Saffron was uh, when he was hauled before a royal commission into liquor activities. Abe lied about the ownership of his pubs. The liquor commission caught him out and forced him to sell the hotels and close down the Roosevelt. Abe moved on. It was 1955 and his Las Vegas connections kept him busy. But then a second scandal. Bad press describing lurid details of his sex life. Abe's right-hand man at the time was Wayne Martin. As the afternoon wore on, the girls naturally got down to just their underwear on. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, Abe and I think his brother, you know, were down to their underwear. And anyway, I, I think I might have been in that club too. Sodomy was involved. Uh... I think it was described in a rather quaint term of an, out, an outrageous sexual act, and it was sodomy of saffron with a woman. Abe was charged with scandalous behaviour after one of the women involved went to the vice squad. And the police prosecutor complained bitterly that uh, there was already evidence that uh, witnesses had been interfered with and, and threatened. No one had been pinched since 1834 for it, and, uh, and we, we beat it. We beat it, yeah. Abe retreated from the limelight. Bad publicity was bad for business. From now on, he would work behind the scenes. In 1957, the first Boeing 707 touched down in Sydney, and Abe found the United States was even closer. Frank Sinatra four times. Sammy Davis Jr., Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, Fabian, Chubby Checker. I mean, the list just went on. Over 300 acts. In Las Vegas, playground of the mob, Abe was again made welcome. He was a willing apprentice. He was grabbing the attention of the Gambino family and of various uh, underworld uh, mafia types in America because remember their business is the business that my father was in. Abe arrived back in Sydney and created a business model for organized crime that flourishes to this day. Before then they were, you know there were the razor gangs and those sorts of people they were, they were just thugs and crooks in large numbers. Probably Saf the one that introduced organized respectability. So he used dummies, so he used corporate structures. Uh, you know, I knew th that he had many such company, shelf company names of things, and he used partners. There was about 86 companies on this book. He said, oh, I'll make you a director of this, a new director of that. Wayne Martin and his best mate, last card Louis Benedetto, asked Abe to back them in Australia's first strip club, the Staccato. He backed us, put us in for a percentage, of course, we percentage, but um, we saw that we still got our percentage. And anyway, from that, uh, I then went to work for Abe as his right-hand man for, well, I suppose, a good 15-odd years through um, trials and tribulations, funds and disasters. In 1959, this was all brand new to Australia, but Abe's talent was in satisfying our most ancient appetites. 
Eventually, he had strip clubs in every major city around the country. The Pink Pussycat in Sydney was the most famous. As well as the usual punters, there was a steady stream of police that Abe paid off to keep the clubs open late. First of all, I'm introduced to strip tees when I'm like 13. I see all these naked girls cavorting around. I'm taken to the dressing room where they're completely naked and actually doing things to me because I'm the boss's son. Doreen still hoped Abe would become a full-time husband and father, but it wasn't going to happen. Around 1960, when he was 41... Abe took up with 23-year-old variety dancer Rita Hagenfeld. And in 1963, they had a daughter, Melissa. Now, as a father and daughter relationship, I couldn't have hoped for a better father. You know, this is a man that would sit in bed with me and read stories at night time. He would cuddle me to sleep. You know, I would cry to him because I left my handbag in a restaurant and I've rung the restaurant when I was 10 years of age and they haven't found it. But he said, don't worry, darling, we'll find it. And then the next morning, there it was at the end of my bed. You just don't question it. You just, you know he created magic. How that happened, I don't know. It just happened. Two nights with Alan and Doreen. Two nights with Rita and Melissa and the rest of the time taking care of business, the way he always did. I think he was a sex addict. In fact, I'm convinced he was a sex addict. There's no other explanation, because I don't know how much he loved any of the women. These were times made for Abe, and it was all about to get even better. In September 1965, Robert Askin became Premier of New South Wales. Now organised crime reached to the very top. Gambling, I don't think you ever eliminate gambling. We've had gambling with us uh, through the centuries. We've had prostitution with us since the year dot. And you can't eliminate those things. The police weren't only turning a blind eye to crime at that stage. They were actually involved in it personally. You know, if the bank robberies was there, you could rest assured that the armed hold-up squad was involved in it. Uh, the prostitution was run by the vice squad. It was the same with the, the illegal casinos. And the police used to actually provide security for all the casinos in Sydney. They, uniformed officers would guard them. Uh, uniformed officers would take their takings to the bank and bank them in the middle hour, early hours of the morning. Although illegal, across the city, backroom casinos flourished, run by a coterie of criminals, including Baccarat Kings Dick Riley and Joe the Boss Taylor, and the Prince of the Track, Perse Galea. Premier Askin collected dues from all of them, and he needed a bag man. Now, what my father did, as the money came in from all the various different enterprises, illegal enterprises that he was not running but watching over and providing the bagman services he took his service fee out which was usually around 10 percent and the remaining 90 percent went to the very top the payoff had to go to two places it had to go to the commissioner of police and the premier of the state it was always those two the higher i reached the further there was to fall, and he felt the need to protect his position. He became, I think, I don't know whether it would be nervous, maybe that's not the right word, but concerned, or wanting insurance, if you will. Saffron then realised that he was onto a, uh, the embryo of a wonderful idea to preserve his, his um, invincibility forever. Saffron ran a coterie of high-class prostitutes, call girls. And uh, he gave them to his friends for free. The Lodge 44, which was his motel, several of the rooms were just glorified brothel rooms. But they were, it wasn't entirely free as it appeared because Saffron also had the rooms that they used tapped 
were with listening devices and also cameras. They would take pictures of what was occurring and then present them to the, the victim uh, and they were theirs from then on. He would have over a minister, a police commissioner, businessmen, very, very high-ranking people, people of the most highest ranks. I believe that the police commissioners and Askin were in that position. Anything Saffron wanted to do would be given the nod because there was invariably a compromising group of photographs. Look, there's no doubt that um, I did um, use uh, sexual favours uh, to um, bolster his power. More particularly, he um, wasn't afraid to use it as blackmail too if it suited him. So basically the police ran dead on anything that involved Saffron. Yeah, he never got investigated, therefore he was never prosecuted. Not only that, they protected him. He never got shot at. Or, and his whole career, when other crime lords were dropping like nine pins around Sydney, Saffron sailed through unmolested. The small boy from the wrong side of the tracks had grown up. His burgeoning property portfolio, which included much of King's Cross, provided a veneer of legitimacy. His contacts at the big end of town spread through businessman Sir Peter Abels and leading property developers Sir Paul Strasser, John Sherody and Frank Tiemann. The big show, the big show. Come on now, ladies, half price tonight. In 1968, R&R came to Sydney. 1,500 American soldiers fresh from the battlefields in Vietnam started hitting King's Cross every week looking for rest and recreation. They were part of a cultural shift that was felt around the nation, and Abe's empire exploded. At his peak, my father had over a hundred brothels, 50 nightclubs, all of which traded after the normal drinking hours. If the license in one city was 12, he'd, travel, he'd usually trade till four or five in the morning. Abe needed a tough guy to run his Sydney clubs for him. A pugnacious Scott, Jim Anderson, seemed perfect. When a competitor tried to muscle in on Abe's turf, Jim showed his mettle. And in turn, Abe demonstrated just how influential he'd become. They decided that the first place to have a trial run would be one of Saffron's places, which was the Venus Room. They wanted to put six girls working the bar area. And I said, no, I said, that's not on. Abe's rival sent standover man Donnie Smith to pay Jim a visit. His speciality was a lead-lined glove. Later, for a television documentary, Jim starred in his own reenactment of what took place that night. Donnie, you know, uh, he did hit me, by the way. It was the best hit I've ever had. It broke my jaw, knocked all my lovely teeth out, um, cost me twenty thousand dollars all up to get them fixed. Jim shot Donnie in the chest. And unfortunately, he stood up again. And that, that is frightening. I then shot him in the leg, and he kept going. Jim's third shot hit Donnie in the back as he left the club. He, he was actually dead. It was just his nervous reactions were kept him going, you know. Jim Anderson was charged with murder. But in this first very public display of Abe's power, the case was no build. Now, no bill is where the Justice Minister can determine that a case will not proceed. They never give reasons. They never have given reasons why. As a lawyer, I have a lot of trouble understanding that, but the Attorney-General of the time, Sir Kenneth McCaw, must have understood it because he no-billed him. The story is that the police investigation was most inadequate. And again, Abe owned all the police in King's Cross. In the early 70s under Premier Ascot, international money flooded in, fueling a business-led real estate burn. The heartbeat of Sydney has always been property development, but now the city was to be transformed into a corporate hub, and inner city land values skyrocketed. Residents battled to save their homes, but the developers had Ascot and the police in their pockets. As usual, Abe wanted to stay in the shadows, but that became difficult when the conflict reached his personal fiefdom, King's Cross. In Victoria Street, 
he became enmeshed in one of the most famous of Sydney's unsolved mysteries, the disappearance of Juanita Nielsen. Juanita Nielsen joined the uh, very active uh, local group of people who were opposed to Frank Tiemann's redevelopment in Victoria Street. Tiemann was very close to Abe Saffron. He was one of his card-playing mates who were very close to him. Frank Tiemann was spending millions buying up the Victorian terrace houses and in one week he evicted over 400 residents. He planned to build a series of imposing towers. Juanita was the heiress of a, a large retail store family, Mark Foy's in Sydney. And uh, she was a bit of a rebel in the family. She set up a business in a little terrace house in uh, 202 Victoria Street in King's Cross. Took over a newspaper that the Wayside Chapel had begun. Juanita used her paper to campaign against the developers, while Tiemann drew on support from Askin and Saffron. The uh, state police were used to stand by and drag the squatters out while doors were smashed in by thugs and standover men who'd worked around the blue movies and the strip joints and the massage parlours of King's Cross for people like Abe Saffron. The bouncers, the heavies, would come down. Rather than getting evicted by a real estate agent, you get evicted by a couple of gorillas from the Venus room. It's not the same thing. It's what made the whole thing different. There was a, an association between the clubs and the development. Resident action groups, union work bands and Juanita's determined campaign led to a standoff. And by mid-1975, Frank Tiemann was losing millions in interest repayments. And then on the uh, 4th of July 1975, she vanished, disappeared. Well, she was killed. The suspicion uh, began to fall on Saffron as being in some way behind it. That was because people knew of his close relationship with Tima. David Farrell was Juanita's lover and worked with her on the paper. He was the last person known to speak to Juanita. I spoke to her that morning when she was, she was running late, she'd had a late night, and um, she was on her way to the carousel, but not out of fear. Juanita had been invited to Abe Saffron's Carousel nightclub to discuss advertising in her paper. As this was the last reported sighting, the police may have been expected to thoroughly investigate the club. That did not occur, and the reason that did not occur was that this was sensitive territory. This was property owned by Abe Saffron. This would have been bad for business. It would have been very bad for business. It took police a couple of years to even interview Saffron during the Juanita investigation. And you could barely call it an interview. It was a doorstop a chat at his home at Vaucluse. The word around the cross was that Juanita was killed inside the carousel by Jim Anderson or other employees of Abe's. The motive for the murder? To get her out of the way so the Victoria Street development could progress. There are other stories. Juanita's death has inspired books, movies, and even an opera. It's a classic Sydney story that goes to the city's dark heart. Abe Saffron was intrinsically linked to the Juanita case on a number of counts. One was that it was, uh, in large part, Saffron's dossiers that caused her to be killed. Tony Reeves believes that it all goes back to Shirley Beger, the woman with the camera behind the mirror. Shirley Beager compiled the details of who the participants were. She was the booking agent, as it were, for the kids, the prostitutes, the showgirls, time, dates, places and names. Reeves believes that at some point Shirley had had enough and decided she wanted to use the dossiers to escape Abe and start a new life. She had made arrangements to meet a, a man at Checkers nightclub to sell them. Saffron sent her estranged husband, Sonny, to recover the documents and do whatever it takes. At that moment, policemen got out of a car. They'd seen it all happen. According to Reeves, the policemen were tracking Shirley with an eye to a blackmail racket of their own. They got rid of her body and stored Abe's dossiers in the vault of a bank in the country town of Kula. 
then started targeting notables, including media magnate Sir Frank Packer. Years go by, and uh, we catch up with the Juanita Nielsen story, and a man in Parramatta Jail wrote me a letter saying that he had been hired to recover the dossiers from a bank in Coolar, west of Newcastle. Part-time inventor and full-time criminal, William Allen Honeyset was serving 28 years for bank robbery. His obsessive letters to Reeves and others outline a conspiracy involving Shirley Beger, Abe's dossiers, the death of Juanita, and the attempt to blackmail Packer. Packer got fed up with it, and they hired this Alan William Honeyset to go and rob the bank and recover the dossiers. He did that, copied the dossiers, and then returned to Sydney and then was arrested. Honeyset claimed that Sir Frank had promised to look after him. And if he was arrested and jailed, $14,000 for each year, he spent in jail, and Sir Frank Packer would use his undoubted influence to get him sprung out of jail early. Honeyset pleaded guilty. Then his luck really did run out. Frank Packer died. Honeyset wrote to Sir Frank's son, Kerry, stating his case and threatening to expose all he knew. Kerry Packer didn't want to know about this. And here's this man. Now, there's a big problem with Honeyset. He was uh, identified, quite correctly as I understand, as a paranoid schizophrenic. Could have invented the whole story. Looking for a way out of jail, Reeves believes Honeyset sent Abe's dossiers to Juanita Nielsen to publish, to reopen his case with disastrous results. And that's why Juanita got killed, because it was discovered that she had these dynamite dossiers. He called them my dossiers of dynamite, and they certainly were. Tony Reeves suggests Juanita was lured to a meeting at a King's Cross motel. That meeting was to be at the Lido Motel on uh, at lunchtime on the 4th of July, 1975. And she went there. And she was killed there. And they... <laughs> sorry. And they cut her into pieces and put the pieces down an incinerator. And we know that's what happened. We absolutely know. Was Juanita murdered because she had Abe's dossiers or because of her involvement with the Victoria Street protests? 35 years after her death, we're not really any closer to the truth. But whatever the case, it seems Abe is always there in the background. It's been alleged that Juanita uh, had 16 dossiers. There's no evidence to support this. Absolutely none. If there were dossiers, Juanita did not have them. I'm positive of that. I had the key to her safe deposit box. I was her confident in all things. I actually uh, have access to those photos. Of course, I've put them in safety deposit box and I've given a copy to the police and I've let them decide what to do. I don't, I'm not in the business of really using scandal to destroy people. I just happened to be get them from his estate, you know, I just found them and I was just lucky, I guess. Alan Saffron says his life would be in danger if he released the pictures, so he won't. No investigation fingered Abe or anyone else over Juanita's death. There was increasing public unease about crooked cops and politicians. When the new government of Neville Rand came to power in New South Wales in 1976, people were looking for a fresh start. 34-year-old Frank Walker was Rand's new Attorney General. Rand's approach was basically to legalise the, these illegal problems that were causing so much corruption in the state. And so legalisation of casinos, that sort of thing, which ruined the business of all the crime lords that were running them. Money from what used to be crime now went straight into government coffers, but Abe continued to prosper. Saffron was certainly at his peak financially and peak of his power in the 70s and 80s. 
and maybe into the 90s. Although I didn't notice any obvious corruption around the, uh, the government, but he still would have had those linkages through the bureaucracy in other places where he could get what he wanted. Abe thrived by becoming a lender of last resort. For those having trouble with regular banks, he offered short-term loans at high interest rates, which meant he needed muscle to collect. I was convinced that he wasn't a particularly violent person. However, he condoned violence. In other words, if someone wasn't paying a bill, he had enforcers who would go out and get the money. Abe's power was felt around the country. With sex, booze and gambling laws liberalised, many major criminals had turned to drug supply. In South Australia, they decided to target Abe. South Australian Attorney General Peter Duncan tabled a police report which alleged Abe was involved in the heroin trade. The drug squad were regular attenders at, uh, at Abe Saffron's uh, premises and, uh, as I said, were provided, according to this report, with food and drink and the possibility of uh, women as well. Stung, Abe emerged from the shadows to meet the accusation head on. For the first time since the scandals of the early 50s, he faced the glare of publicity. Personally, I don't know any members of the drug squad. And as far as saying that uh, I, again, have any connection with the drug scene or drug trafficking in any way at all, is a complete lie. I can't deny it uh, strongly enough. The fact is he was a facilitator of drugs at his clubs in Sydney, not a supplier. I've no doubt he would not have got that close to that coalface, but in every one of his clubs he could buy drugs. Going public was risky for Abe. His life, his record and his family came under scrutiny. Presumably the general public are going to think, how can this man be honest? I mean, the charges range from betting to receiving stolen goods to having an unlicensed pistol to scandalous conduct. But a lot of people can say, does it, it worry you that be... some of that mud sticks? Well, of course, I was under uh, uh, a misapprehension, apparently, that these matters were finished and it was over with. Yet, uh, as you see yourself, it goes back many, many years. 1938 was before the war. Alan, it must be hard for you. Not really, because uh, I support my father 100%. I think the allegations are shocking, absolutely shocking. And I do love my father. I love him very much. But more than I love him, I respect him. And I respect him because of the fact that I have learned business principles from him. And if it wouldn't be for my father helping me and uh, guiding me in the correct way, then uh, certainly I wouldn't be in any position at all. But behind the public front, the relationship between father and son was never straightforward. And things took an interesting turn after Alan married his first wife, Susie, in 1973. Yes, my father... Abe had a very good relationship with my ex-wife Susie. He was incredibly and ridiculously generous. And every time she had a child, he would give her diamonds and give her wonderful gifts. And uh, it was just ridiculous what he was doing. A lot of people said that she was more interested in him than even me. She might have even had a bit of an affair with him. I just don't know. I can't support that with any valid thing. It's just been talked about. Eventually, Alan left Australia and settled in Los Angeles, where he runs a talent agency. He married a second time and started a new family. After his father's death, Alan wrote a book about Abe. He called it Gentle Satan. I got a call from a, uh, uh, a gentleman. He said, my father read your book and uh, found it very fascinating, but it's uh, inaccurate. Uh, your father was a very violent man. And uh, sure enough, uh, he came forward with, uh, I believe it was five murders that my father was directly and absolutely implicated with. One he was actually involved with, which was the brothel, and the others were just in the building of his power. 
Alan is the first and only person to suggest Abe was directly and personally involved in murder. His judgment of my father is obviously a calculated one and how much that is for his own purpose is yet to be determined by maybe God, who knows, he's the only one really that knows what's going on in Alan's mind. As they grew up, Melissa and Alan only met three or four times. Alan was aware of his father's notoriety from an early age, but Melissa was on her way to school aged 13 when she saw Abe on the front page of the newspaper. I went, wow, that's my dad. And uh, then I started to read the headlines and of course it was linked with the words um, as a criminal or Mr. Sin or the head of the mafia or words to that effect. And I think I felt shock. I felt really hurt. I didn't show my emotion on the bus. Yeah, but I cried. It was very sad. I think that I did mention it later on when things started to calm down. And he said, yes, darling. He said, there is people out there that need to print those things to, in order to sell newspapers. But you tell me, what do you think and what do you feel about me? I said, well, I don't think that feels true. And he said, well, then it isn't. In 1979, the ghost train at Luna Park burnt to the ground with the loss of seven lives, including six children. Once again, suspicion swirled around the Saffron name. ...to unravel one of its greatest mysteries. The tragic fire of June 9, 1970... Sydney artist Martin Sharp produced an exhibition that pointed to Abe as part of a conspiracy to take over the park. ...three hours before she learned that her two children, aged four and six, were dead and her 29-year-old husband had also perished in this inferno. Well, what did it say about Sydney? Well, it said that Sydney was corrupt enough for, to, for people to be confident enough to perform such an act in, so publicly. And to those who knew who was behind it all, you know, they took control of Sydney that night. There is clear evidence that Saffron wanted to take over the park. Uh, it fits in with his personality. The park sits under the Harbour Bridge and across from the Opera House. It's extremely desirable real estate. Do you have any connection directly or indirectly with the Lunar Park site? None at all. The police and the coroner investigated the fire. And five years later, so did the National Crime Authority. All three declared it an accident. The sparks from the train set alight to one of these Terps and paint impregnated pieces of canvas. That's how the fire started. People were saying Saffron was trying to get control of uh, Luna Park, but uh, there was nothing in that. If there was a skerrick of evidence there that Saffron was involved, he would be in jail now charged with murder. But later, it became clear that there was a link between Abe and the company which eventually took control of the park. There appears to have been a determined effort to hide the true family and business involvement of Saffron in the company Harborside Amusements Park Proprietary Limited. Did you try to hide your connection? I've got no idea who said it, but it's untrue. Untrue or not, the mud stuck. The 80s was a tough time for Abe. His political connections started running for cover. And amid ongoing media speculation about Juanita's disappearance, he fell out with his chief lieutenant, Jim Anderson. In the last five years, I have attempted to divorce myself from any association with Abe Saffron. To divorce Abe Saffron is a very painful and very expensive experience. Because most of the people that uh, have been associated with him are in positions of great power in this country. He doesn't reach just state level, he reaches federal level. Jim saw safety in going public. And that was the last place Abe wanted to be. His right-hand man had become a serious threat. Abe locked him out of the clubs 
and pretty quickly Jim, allegedly, went broke. He claimed that Abe owed him $160,000 and he was determined he was going to get his money or get Abe. He didn't say much to me about Abe. Uh, he, he was interested in protecting himself. He was an informant to me about various matters of organised crime. And uh, indeed, on the night when he was shot at in his unit up at, in the eastern suburbs, uh, the police came to me because they thought I might be an ex. And the marksman was an expert marksman who only missed because Jim hesitated walking through a room. Yeah, but I think there'd be a list of people who'd want to shoot Jimmy Anderson, and Abe, though Abe may have been on it, um, I think there would have been quite a few others as well. Jimmy had a lump, lot of other business interests outside Abe. Nine years after Juanita Nielsen disappeared, there was an inquest into her murder. The longest inquest in New South Wales history. Jim Anderson emerged as a prime suspect. But by revealing how Abe avoided paying tax, he diverted public attention away from himself and paved the way for Abe's downfall. A normal bar or club, you'd have uh, your tills working white up until your legal trading hours. Tills working white meant that they reflected the legal and accountable situation to the tax department. Then, say, if you're running a 12 o'clock restaurant, like the Venus Room, and uh, we used to trade till 8 o'clock in the morning. Then your black tails came into operation where there was no recorded takings from 12 o'clock onwards. Eight hours tax-free, seven nights a week, with drinks at a premium. For the first time, an insider went on record describing Abe's accounting methods. All of the uh, suggestions and if, uh, are untrue. Untrue, completely untrue. At the inquest, not only did Abe deny Jim's accusations, he claimed he hardly knew the man. He also denied the developer Frank Tiemann was a friend. The coroner concluded Juanita had been murdered. Who did it? He couldn't say. He criticised the police investigation, saying it had been affected by an atmosphere of corruption, real or imagined. Abe may have been free of the spectre of Juanita, but he was not free of Jim Anderson. Jim had made copies of Abe's accounts. Did you keep two sets of books to keep track of this black and white cash? Of course. And did you have custody of those books? I did. He gave them to me one night uh, and I put them in the back of my car and uh, when I was leader of the opposition, in fact, and uh, they remained in my office uh, for some months obviously as an insurance because he felt at risk and he wanted to know that he could say look if I get killed the second set of books etc Jim's books ended up with the National Crime Authority this new investigative body established by Prime Minister Bob Hawke in 1984 chose Abe Saffron as their very first target it didn't matter whether it was Hawke in power or anyone else in power. My father just was plain too powerful and he was becoming too embarrassing and almost too greedy. That was my father's problem. He just, he was so obsessed with money and power that he lost sight of reality in the sense that you can't have that much control and that much power without scaring people, without really making them want to bring you down. They courted Jim Anderson. Uh, they saw him as their, their ticket to a conviction. They needed a high-profile uh, conviction, given that you know, this was um, a newly established authority. They needed some runs on the board. The secretive NCA collected thousands of files, but revealed little publicly about Abe. They were interested in getting him on tax evasion, and Jim's books were just the ticket. We chose what we described as the Al Capone method. We decided that the only way we would really nail him would be on the taxation evasion charge because we reckoned that the police who would have been involved in the matters other than that 
uh, could have been bought off by him and would have convenient lapses of memory when it came to going into the witness box. I knocked on the door, he answered the door, um, extremely pleasant. He then turned to me and he said, um, and where are you from? I told him the Federal Police Force. Whereabouts in Australia do you come from? And I said Melbourne. He then turned to another person and he asked me where that person came from and I gave him the same answer every time. He said, what, no New South Wales Police? I said, no, not one. Isn't that surprising? Living in the house when his grandfather was arrested was Alan's eldest son, David. His demeanour was uh, shock, but very stoic at the same time. He was blank. He didn't answer any questions as he normally does. He just walked, you know, got pulled into this car and driven off. We found the books. There's uh, two books, Black Book and The White Book. The money that was in the safe and the diamonds they never found. My grandfather had a secret compartment built into the downstairs cupboard you had to take out the drawer, then you had to slide a panel across, then you had to slide another panel across, and then there was a safe. You'd open the safe up, there'd be cash in, in wads of uh, $5,000 allotments. Then there was another compartment on the drawer, which would have bags, black bags, maybe six of them, filled with diamonds, and there'd be gold cougaran on the top. Uh, each gold coin would be about thirty or 40000 so that was his safe. The 69-year-old Abe Saffron, it was a day he and no doubt many others thought would never come. After two years in the courts, Abe was found guilty of tax evasion. In October 1988, at the age of 69, his journey from the Annandale Draper's shop ended up in a Long Bay jail cell. He was frightened, as anybody would be. He was facing three years in maximum in jail and he wasn't a young man and i think that was the beginning of the end of the joyous bubbling vivacious character that he was full-time to this part-time character that evolved and the sadness crept in when you arrest a person and they go to jail they lose the aura about them and that's what happened to Al Capone, that's what happened to Abe Saffron. Well it was difficult at first but then they increased the size of his cell, they gave him a lot of comfort like a sofa and a television and <laughs> they treated him like a celebrity guest. Inside, Abe did his best to live life as usual. He was still the boss and he celebrated Christmas by organising a Chinese banquet and a performance by Lay Girls Transvestite Review. After just 13 months, he was released from prison. But it was clear that Abe's days of influence were over. He turned to family and increasingly, Terry, his last mistress. I don't think that Doreen initially knew about my relationship with Abe. She knew that I worked for him when she eventually found out, she was terribly angry and she never spoke to me again. That's... she moved to Perth. True to form, Abe split his time between Terry in Sydney and Doreen in Perth. After 52 years of marriage to Abe Saffron, Doreen died in 1999. In the final seven years of his life, Abe sold off his business interests and lived on income from his properties. Oh, it was great. We went on a lot of cruises. We went all around the world, really. Mediterranean, the Caribbean, Las Vegas. We went to Israel quite a bit because Abe had friends there and he loved being in Israel. In Israel, heart problems put him in hospital. And on the way home to Australia, he had a fall in Bangkok. Back in Sydney, Abe ended St Vincent's Hospital, just down the road from King's Cross. I was holding his hand. I used to go to the hospital every day. And um, he just suddenly died. Just 
passed away. It was it's such a shock. To do business, to conduct business, to be involved in business was the air he breathed. That's what kept him young, that's what kept him alive. Right up until the time he died, he was still conducting business on the phone in the hospital bed one week before he died. I said, Dad, you know. He says, darling, I've just got to think I'll be with you in a minute. In his final years, Abe visited Allen and family in Los Angeles several times. His grandchildren in California and Australia remember a loving man who doted on them. In a morality tale, crooks are supposed to die miserable. Abe beat the odds. He spent his final days surrounded by family that loved him. To the end, he hung onto his money. Officially, his estate was 25 million, but some reports suggested figures of up to 150 million. Abe left his eight grandchildren one million dollars each. Terry got property and money, and so did Melissa. Alan was given only $500,000, along with a stipulation that if he challenged the will, he would lose it. One person said to me that there might have been a three-card Monty pulled on his will. In other words, three wills laid out, signs one and they exchange it with the other. <laughs> In 1985, the National Crime Authority's initial report on Abe alleged he was involved in bribery, corruption, prostitution, fraud, and the supply and distribution of narcotics. But because they chose the Al Capone approach, the truth or otherwise of those ongoing claims has never been tested. To this day, local, state, and federal politics is haunted by Abe's enduring legacy, the business model for organized crime that he established in Australia.